Praise the Lord. It's good to spend some time with you once again as we examine another very important subject. We're going to be talking about the common and the sacred fire. Do we really know the difference? You know, sad to say, many people we talk to, many people are email, they call, and they ask a lot of questions, and it's good. We can pray together. We can study Scripture together. But, you know, some are just, really, you know, they just said, I'm not sure if this is, is the right thing to do or if we shouldn't be doing this or if this is, belongs to God and, and yet somebody else is using it for common things. You know, what is the difference? What does it really mean, common and sacred? So in our study, our four-part series, this is the second part, we're going to be examining many things that will help us to understand that which belongs to God is sacred. And then you have the common, that's things out in the world. And we need to separate those things, and there needs to be a separation among us as God's last day people. So, you know, get your Bible ready, pencil and paper. And I might say before we have our prayer, we're so thankful for each one of you who are, are, are tuning in. Some are setting your DVRs and others are, you know, just make sure they're there. They set their alarms and they get up. We're very grateful and thankful for that. But there's many people who really love the undiluted truth. They want the straight testimony. Most people say they do, but you know, where are they at? Let's come to the surface. What do you say? Say, we believe in getting back to the principles of God's word and by God's grace and strength, we're going to advocate those things. So I'm thankful for you today. I want you to pray for us as we go into this subject. And I might mention again that we're, we're thankful that you, you call and that you write and you're ordering the DVDs and support this ministry so the message can continue to go out. So let's have prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Holy Spirit to be with us and help us as we study His Word one more time. Our kind, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. Now we ask for your Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Spirit of the living God in our hearts and our minds that the things of this world will grow strangely dim. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to heed your voice. Help us to know and uh, certainly listen to your voice for what is truth and then apply it to our hearts and to our lives. Lord, we need you today. Bless us, we pray. Cleanse us, cover us with your blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, as we, you know, delve into this subject, I... I it, it, it much more, you say, well, I've heard before. I want you to, this is, a, remember, four parts. So about four hours are going to be spent on a lot of uh, different subjects that still come back and clump together to help us to understand that, number one, that pleases God, not man. I sense so often talking to people that it, it's, it's all about pleasing mankind or pleasing, you know, a certain church. Or, or the, it's about pleasing God, isn't it? So we have to look at it in the light as heaven, right, light of heaven, that we'll be able to find out what truth is. Now, some of you, I'm going to shame on you, you probably did not, you know, see or listen to the, the first part. So if you allow me to go over several parts that we discussed, and if they're of interest, you won't want to miss that first part, too, when you order the, the whole series. In our first part, we, dis we discovered, number one, that God would have a clear and definite ideas preserved between the sacred and the common. Did you notice that? Clear, definite, that which is common and that which is sacred. Two, it, it may be shocking to some, I've mentioned it several times before, but you know, Satan has a church, the synagogue of, of the devil, of the enemy, Revelation 3, verse 9. Now we realize his members, you can identify his members. I want you to think with me for a moment. How can we identify? It has to be, right, God's church or it's the church of the enemy. Uh, and I understand this. Some people say, oh, it's just too difficult. It's too hard. Oh, we don't want to hear these things. Bless your heart. It either is you, you are for God or you are against him. You are a member of his church or you're a member of the synagogue of Satan, the Bible talks about. How can we identify those who are members of the enemy's church? Number one, naturally, they are children of disobedience the Bible talks about. They're disobedient to the word. They're disobedient about a lot of things that are being taught in the church and they want to have their own opinion and, and do their own thing. So they're rebelling against the word of God. Number two, they choose to do the wrong thing. And just make clear, they choose to sin. They understand many of the issues, but they choose to please themselves. Number three, very powerful. Please pay attention. The synagogue of Satan, right? Satan's members of his church. They, they try to mingle truth and error. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about common and sacred. They're trying to make, mingle the truth and error together. Make it a little easier. No, no self-denial. 
No giving up anything in the cause of Christ. Now again, how can we find out what, what church that we belong to that we're a member of? Remember, I think it's so important. Satan's church tries to make void the law of God. And I'll just be, I'll just be bold with you here. The, anyone who's saying, you know, God, God's law, you know, we don't have to worry about keeping it anymore. I think, friend, we belong to what? The enemy's church because that, he, he started that in heaven. Do you remember? Oh, we can't obtain it. You know, we can't do all these things that God says to do. Same argument going on today. So we need to realize that, you know, God's law is here and it certainly is binding. Now, number, uh, number three, I think, is very interesting. Heirs are being presented. We discussed this in part one. Heirs are being presented as the truth. We almost must realize, too, that these same sins that the enemy used at the time, just before the flood, he will use again. See, we can look back and we can, we can go over these things and we can say, oh, well, that was for them. No, it's for us today. Go back, recount, read, study these things, because he will use the same things again because they were effective. How sad. And we learned also that God's church is accountable to him and him alone. Bottom line. God's church is what? Accountable to him. It's interesting, Acts the Apostles 10, some rise up in opposition, but you know, I love to read the Bible, I love to read the spirit of prophecy, and you know, if it's clear and simple and straight, that's just the way it is. God helped me to understand it and to follow it. And so I can read something like this, and I say, thank you, Lord, because we're always talking about his church and the faithful followers. But it, the Acts, Acts the Apostles 10 says, from the beginning, faithful souls have constituted the church on earth. Interesting. What's constituted the church on earth? The faithful soul. Are you a faithful soul? Friends, if you're not advocating the teachings and doctrines of God's word right now, you're not a faithful soul. If you know better and you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing, you really can't say that you're a faithful soul. Okay, by God's grace, good news is we all can. You know, let's get self out of the way and let's look at God's word and say, God, I, I want to I reach that high standard that you have, you have for your people. And you'll help us to do that. We can't do it without you. And number seven is the, the third angel's message, as we look at it here, calls for us to worship the true God. Makes sense, doesn't it? We just spent a little bit of time on that in the first part. God calls us, third angel message, to worship the true God and understand that by God's grace, by God's power, man can completely obey God's law. Isn't that wonderful? What? By God's grace, by his power and his strength, he will enable us, just like Jesus did while he was here on earth. Last point. We're talking about the, the church of Satan. We talk about in Revelation 3, 9. says this. says that man can never obey God's laws. Did you get that? Satan is still advocating today. And you know what's sad to say? majority of Christians today are saying the same thing. Maybe it's because they don't understand it. But you know what? That's our job, isn't it? To bring it to light. And, and I thank God for that light. And I praise Him for that light. And accept that light. Embrace that light. Be excited about that light. You know, we have to realize in this world that we live in, as we really pick up here on, on part two, as we begin, I want to go just a little deeper in some of the things that we just discussed a moment ago. If we, if we go a little bit deeper into uh, Revelation chapter 14, and we start talking about the, the second angel's message, please bear with me a minute. The message is simply Babylon is, is fallen, is fallen. And then, you know, I believe that Satan, you know, once we hear this message, once we say, well, I understand because it's false. We need to come apart. We need to separate. We need to accept the doctrines and the teachings of God's Word. And so we, we need to, to take a bold stand for what is right. But and once we say, well, you know, I see that maybe I need to do this. or but This is the thing really to do. But, you know, if you refuse to do it, once it comes to light to your mind or to my mind, let me just be bold with you. Satan will take possession of your mind. He's going to take possession of the churches as a whole, as a body, not talking about every individual, as a body for those who reject this message. Now think about it. So, it, see, it's shocking because most Christians will say something like, this is a Christian church. You know, this is where the Holy Spirit's at. Oh, it should be, yes. But you know, there are conditions of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon God's last day people. Are you part of God's last day people? I'm sure that you want to be. You're striving, aren't you, by the grace of God? I'm striving to be part of that remnant church. 
that last day church that keep the commandments of God have the testimony of Jesus. Friend, don't be ashamed of the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed of the three angels' message. Friend, when we hear these things, and if we will not accept them as, remember, individually, as, as a body, as a church, the enemy comes over, and he takes possessions as a whole of those churches and us individually. Why? Because we're rejecting light. Some of you will say, oh, listen, the devil is crowding his way. He's pushing his way into the churches today, and little do we realize it. My friend, why? Why is it that we can't realize? Why can't we see? Why? Because we're lowering the standards, the teachings of God's Word, and as we lower these standards, bless your heart, the enemy comes in. It's him that's influencing to lower the standards a little bit and make brother so-and-so happy or sister so-and-so happy or the pastor happy, whatever it might be, rather than say, we need to elevate the teachings of God's Word. Elevate. As you elevate those, it will cause people to look at them closely. And yes, they will make a decision. And yes, some will be offended. Jesus said, as they heard the truth, he said, by and by, they were what? Oh, good. They were offended. Now, what happens when we get offended? Well, sometime we leave. Now, think about that. The enemy then is chosen to mingle the common with the sacred. And we realize that God will not bless. He will not bless any kind of compromise of the truth. So why are we doing it? Why are, many, why are many doing it? We know that it's not a teaching in God's Word. We might even admit that it's not a teaching of God's Word. But you know, bless our heart, if it's not in the Word of God, why don't we lay it aside? You know why? Because self is so wrapped up in it. We want to see it. We want to do it. Oh, friend, let's pray for the anointing of the Spirit, that God will break us down, as it were, by the power of His Spirit, that we may be hearers of the Word, right? hearers only, but endures of the Word. Are you listening? Are you a doer? Oh, let's ask God to help us to do that. Now, many of you say, well, I, I understand. Oh, you're talking about the enemy taking control of the church. Where do you think he's working? We've talked about it many times, and we will continue because of the hour in which we live. The enemy has invaded the churches, every one that he possibly can. You know how he invades it? He invades it through people, maybe like you or maybe me. And I don't want that, and I know you don't either, but that's how he invades the church. He causes confusion and division and separation and fusses in the church and argument in the church and separation in the church. Oh, he's, he's having a heyday, and we just don't detect that it's him. Friend, we need to really have some eye salve to put on that God may help us. Now, don't, don't, don't shut it off, please. Don't shut it off. Don't say, well, I think, don't close your ears. I think it's worth listening to today. Do you realize the enemy has a plan? And the plan is, we just touched on a moment ago, is he has a plan to take over all the churches. He don't, remember, he doesn't worry about the world. I don't care how often you hear this, dear friends, how often I hear it and understand. He's, he has a plan to take over every church. He hates every child of God. Now, as the enemy has this plan to take over the churches, let me just remind you of this. He has not forgotten the formula that works. Some of you are not with me. You realize the enemy has a formula. And he uses that formula on you and me and anybody who just leaves the door cracked open just a little bit, a little bit of a wedge right there, he's able to come in. And once he become, comes in and we begin to question Scripture, we begin to question the truth, the church that maybe we attend and we're been at. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to study. But when we begin to doubt the Word of God, we are on dangerous ground. Why? Because that's the enemy. He's the father of all doubt. And he plants that in you and in me. But praise God, right? He's given us eyes and ears to hear the Word of God, the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us into all truth. We have to realize, regardless of how many times we have read these scriptures, especially in, in First and Second Timothy. First Timothy 4, verse uh, 1, it talks about there's going to be in the last days seducing spirits and doctrine of devil. The devil is a seducer. He's going to kind of tell you what you might want to hear. He's going to try to say, well, well th you know, this is freedom over. This is not the way that it really is. And many of us, because we don't want to make the changes, we think, well, you know, that kind of makes a little bit of sense to me. Friend, anything outside the Word of God just doesn't make sense to me. Praise God. I hope it doesn't make sense to you. Here's the Word of God. It makes sense. Now remember, the devil is going to try to influence you. He's going to try to seduce you. But he's going to give you, notice, doctrines of devils. So it either is the doctrine of Christ or it's the doctrines of devil. 
Why is it that we're all so seem like confused on so many teachings of God's Word? Is it possible that maybe we've taken, is it possible that we've taken the, the, the common or, or man, man's teaching and we've just intermingled with some truth a little bit and we're trying to get something a little more, something we can chew on a little bit better, something that fits our lifestyle a little bit better? Or do you want to really be converted? Do you really want to be changed into the image of Jesus Christ? Oh, I'm sure that you do. You know, Paul understood this very well. I'm sure much better maybe than any of us. But he, he explained it in 2 Timothy 1 verse uh, 13. Here's simply what he said, bottom line. And he says it to me, and I know he says it to you today. He says, hold fast. Hold fast to the form of sound words. Something is sound. Something is concrete in the word of God. You know that it is. He says, hold fast to that. Why are you going to hold fast? As soon as you get a hold of something that you know is truth and it's right, the old devil comes against and he starts beating and banging and challenging you and challenge your family, challenge your children. Everything is a challenge to see whether you're going to hang by faith, are you? This is what it's all about. Or you're going to try to mix a little common and a little bit, you know, the fire together and you're going to try to make it to where it's pleasing. He said, hold fast to what? Sound words. You know what that means? That means healthy words. That means, uh, uh, that's called free of error. We're to hang on to things that are free of error. 2 Timothy 3, 5. This is one everyone quotes because we see it so often. I don't want to see it in my own life. I'm sure I've seen it there before. You know, God forgive me and help me to be on fire because, you know, people say religion, they have a form of what? Good, godliness, 2 Timothy 3, 5. But they're denying what? Good, the power thereof for such turn away. They hear the word of God, right? That has a form of it, but it's not changing their heart and their life. They can quote it. They can talk about it. They can elaborate on it, but they do not let it into their heart. They do not let it into their minds. They do not let it come into where it changes their character into the very image of Jesus Christ. Friends, that's what truth will do. I'm interested in that. I need these changes. Don't you? you do you desire these changes, do you? Do you really want them? Let's not have this form of, of, of godliness, but denying that power. That word is, is, is a dynamite word, that power. That's, that's the, 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 the force of the Holy Spirit, as it were. The strength of the Spirit of the living God. The miracle working power of God. The wonderful work of God. We're denying it in our life. And safe to say, there will be millions today. They don't know what it is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't know whether they've been saved or not. They've been getting these watered down, sugar down, these little old sermons. That, that They're not brought to the point of decision. They're not brought, brought to the point to when you hear the straight testimony, you're going to have to make a decision. You know, in the Bible you read it many times. If you're on the Lord's side, get over here. If you're on the enemy's side, get over there. Hot and cold. But yet we found another way. We think in the Christian world that if we can mingle a little bit, compromise some of these truths, then we're all going to kind of be happy. No, you will be discontent. The only happiness that you can find, the only happiness that I can have in my heart and life, life is a total surrender to Jesus Christ. Heart, mind, soul, body, everything that man. So I don't want a form of godliness. I need to separate from that, that right there. I need that power. That's interesting because we're talking about the form of godliness means a, a formation of God. Something that kind of is formed up all the time. It's what you do. The uh, appearance that it's godly. A formula. A, it, it's a fashion after what is religion. That means the Bible carrier. That means a tithe pair. That means the church. That's talking about, you know. The enemy doesn't care about that. Let me just be, be, be honest with you here. The enemy cares when you hear the truth and you love the truth and you're asking for the Spirit of God to let that truth to come inside and all of a sudden the man that you once were, you're not that way anymore. The woman that you were, the child that you were, you're no longer the same anymore. You don't have to go around and say, whoa, I'm not the same anymore. Boy, I tell you, I've got everything all together. Friend, that's not what about your neighbors and your friends and your mom, your dad, everybody that's involved are going to say, whoa, whoa, what happened? Something has happened. And they're going to say, wow, how, how can they have peace in the midst of a storm? In living in this world that we live in today, in the economy that we live in today, when there was just, it just, it's, just, it's going to crumble any day. All the laws are being passed like that, it just it mind boggles. I'm sure the Bible student, as you read the signs of the time, you need something to hang on. You must have an experience that most people do not have right now. I want that experience. If I do not have it, I will not be able to endure. I'm going to take, oh, Lord, help us. I'm going to take the easy road out. 
Too many people today call themselves Christian and they want to take that easy road. Why? Because everybody's doing it. Everybody's going. Everybody's going here. Everybody's talking about this. Everybody, Friend, if everybody, please, please, we'll talk about that a little bit more just a little bit later. But please, that means what? We need to be a separate people. We need to come apart from the world and don't touch those unclean things. I read something in Desire of Ages, page 172. Oh, please, bless your heart. Please pay attention. Please pay attention. Said, he who is trying, and I, I read this because there's many people who think because of their church membership or because they profess in keeping the Ten Commandment law that automatically everything is fine. Going to make it to heaven. Got a one-way ticket because this is where I go to church. Friend, please don't fool yourself. I find nothing in Scripture that says that. Is it not? Oh, somebody, somebody pray for me. Is it not our personal relationship with Jesus Christ? I believe it is. I believe that's what it's all about. I realize Christ is the head of his church, but he's calling you and he's calling me to be like him. He's not calling us in some half-converted, lukewarm, some kind of a, of a state of, of we just go to church. And, you know, when I go to church, when, when I, we hear the sitting through services, I expect a blessing. I come to receive a blessing. When I leave, I've got a blessing. I don't know about you. That's what it's all about. Or is it grudgingly that you go to church? Is it grudgingly that you pay your tithe? Is it grudgingly that you just have to go maybe do something that in the church that maybe you really didn't want it? Oh, friend, you're serving Jesus Christ. Isn't this what it's all about? Let's not be compromising the truth, the things that we're talking about here. Remember, he who is trying to reach heaven. Oh, I can just see the hands going up. Oh, yes, 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 it's me. I'm trying to reach heaven. Oh, that's good. I'm glad that you made that commitment. But if you're trying to reach heaven by, 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 his, by our own works in keeping the law, we are attempting an impossibility. Did you get it? He who's trying to reach heaven by his own what? By his own works. By his own merits. Huh. By keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. Notice how clear. There is no safety. Did you get it? There's no safety hmm. for one who has merely a legal religion. And that's called what? A form of godliness. We just talked talk, talk about that scripture, didn't we? Many times we don't realize that's what's all, all, all going on here. And I also thought about this, and I jotted it down. It says, in the Christian life, huh, there must be a death to self and sin and a new life altogether. Man, that just really sums up doesn't it? That sums up what it's all about here for us today. A new life. Did you get it? Death to self. A new life in Jesus Christ. See, I believe this all my our heart. The eyes must be open. Why are we closing our eyes and our hearts and our ears to this beautiful message? And as we close them, we're deteriorating spiritually. I'd be safe to say there are those today who, well, my mother said it, and I mentioned it several times before, when I do something that, woo, maybe that I shouldn't be doing, she said, Kenny, 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 you're cutting your own nose off just to spite your own face. Now, you know that's an old saying, you know. And sometimes I didn't really want to hear it, but you know what? It's a true statement. Sometimes we just, just cut our own nose off, and it despites our, our own face. You know, what, it's, people are simply what? fighting themselves, and we're fighting what? Truth. Don't fight the truth. You're gonna, it's going to hurt you. It's going to come back. There, when you fight the truth, listen, you're fighting against yourself. Did you get it? We know you're fighting against God, but you, there's a fight within in you there. Paul says it something like this. Maybe it be clear in 2 Timothy 2, verse 25 and 26. He said, in meekness, instructing those who, that oppose themselves. Did you get it? There are people who oppose themselves. You're fighting against yourself it's because you won't deny self. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, that means fight themselves, if God preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, verse 26, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. When you're fighting yourself, you see, when you don't want to give up and you don't deny yourself, you're fighting, you see, you're in the snare of the devil who are taken captive at his will. Wow, that means you're easy prey. We fight the truth, 
we're fighting what, you know, what is right. We don't want to do it. And we're doing everything we can to, to stay away from those who maybe are, are, are advocating the truth. We don't want to go to the meetings. We don't want to talk to them. We don't want to study the word with them. We're fighting against the truth. Certainly it's against the Holy Spirit. Certainly it's against God. But there's a fight, and that fight is inside of you. And, and Paul says, boy, and, and that they may recover themselves. Some of us need to be recovered. I hear a lot of things about whether well, you know, recovering from alcohol. Or reco How about recovering ourselves from the devil? It can only be done by the Holy Spirit, by pouring your heart, your life, your mind out, and say, oh, God, I need, oh, how I need some help. I'm just falling into every snare that the, that the enemy sets, and I need some help. I can't do it on my own. God says, you know what? I'm going to help you. You know, I, I really believe this. We need to make sure that your soul, that my soul, is thoroughly converted. Please listen to that word. Thoroughly converted. Now, I mean, truly converted. If we're not careful, we will lose that which we have gained. Does that make sense? If we're not thoroughly converted, right? If we go along, we've learned and we're doing it, blah, blah, blah. Make sure that soul is thoroughly converted, rooted and grounded in the truth of God's Word. Friend, I'm telling you today, if you're not, and you're not staying there, you'll end up losing all that that's been gained by the power of the Holy Spirit. Please don't lose what you've gained through His power and through His Word. See, God's calling men today. He's calling people, teachers. He's calling them into His service. Men and women filled with the Spirit of the living God, giving them power, giving them ability, giving them the grace, think about it, to preach the truth. Did you get it? Knowledge, strength, power. He's calling us to preach the truth. You know what? Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, when you think about that power, I think He wants us to be strong. He wants us to be decided. He wants us to be clear. Why? Because I just can't get away from it. Thank you, God. That the world must be warned, and then Jesus is going to come. It must be warned, because the evil one is what we talked about a while ago. He's seducing the world. He's miracle-working power, and we see him going about devouring whom he will. He's working on the whole world. He's planning on seducing you, by the way. Huh. He wants to get the job done. He's working with everything that's in him. Oh, friend, may I plead with you today? Are you pleading with God? Everything that was in you, they say from your toes to the top of your head, for the Holy Spirit, the living God, to come in, to cleanse you, to make you that new person that you need to be, to find that contentment and that peace that the world does not know. It can only come by knowing Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Are you pleading for that new mind? Are you pleading for victory over sin? Is God calling you? Remember, if He calls you, He's going to equip you. He's going to give you that ability and that strength. He's going to give you that mind, mind of Christ. And if He calls you, will you give, by the grace of God, that strong, undiluted testimony? Friend, I pause for a moment because there's things going through my mind right now. I'm saying, oh, God, help me to be able to do the Holy Spirit, take it and word it the right way. There's many people in the world today, in our movement today, that's hollering straight testimony. They're talking about, you know, let, let's, let's give this straight testimony. Let's, let's give the, the real doctrine. Let's give the real truth. And bless your heart, many are missing the mark. I'm not saying I have everything all together, but boy, I'm studying to show myself approved unto God. But many are missing the mark at the same time saying, we've got it, we've got it. Friend, could that be somewhat a little bit of the, of the common and the, and the sacred coming together that we, that we have it and it's, it's going to be kind of, it's going to be good enough no. Is it good enough for, for God? Mingling of the, of the common and the sacred? How about in the days of the apostles? Let's just take that for a moment. Some of the most foolish teachings, heresies were presented as the truth. You remember reading scripture? Even some of the beliefs the disciples had at time before, you know, the, Jesus really working on their heart and life and, and bringing them here. There was all kind of heresies and doctrines of devils that were being thrown around in there. And, and, and you know, history, we find out, will be repeated. So we look back and say, well, what were some of those? You know, talking about the soul or heaven and hell and some of these things and Jesus Christ and Him crucified, the cross of Calvary. And so there was a lot of air that was being in, mingled in, in the place of truth. And I find it... I find it sad to say, you know, I hate to say it today, but it's, it's true. 
It's intermingled, and why not? Friend, if you believe that this is God's last day movement, do you think, have you buried your head so far in the sand that you don't think that he's not going to be working overtime on this movement, on you and on me? I'm not trying to blame anyone specifically here. But there's something wrong. We take teachings today that is not founded in the Word of God. And then you'll find a group that say, well, that's not found in the Word of God. The other group says, well, you know, it's close enough. We'll just accept that and it'll be good. And pretty soon the rest of us will all do this and we're all going to be happy. It's not founded in the Word of God. I mean, solid. And friend, we, 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 we don't need to participate with that. We can't do it. It's wrong. God help us to see how the enemy is doing. Why? I said, well, history will be repeated. You know why? And think about this. You'll say, well, what, what are you talking about? Air? Air is wearing some kind of a new garment. What does that mean? You see, air will come this way and then it will go that way. But please pay attention to this. When air comes along, it, oh, it has new clothes on sometimes. It has a new face. It has a new garment but I tell you this, dear friends, you unmask that air, regardless of how good it looks on the outside, and you unmask that air, that garment. You take the garment off it, and nothing appears. Why? Because it was just what? Something that was put over. Take it off. There's nothing there. Satan works today to attract attention to men in the place of God. I see it. I hear it all the time. He's doing what? He's trying to get me and you to be attracted to, as it were, to, uh, may I say, looking to what some call the bishops, or look to the elders, look to the, the, the pastors, or look at our, our, our professors of theology. Look at someone special, and, and the enemy said, look to these guys, look to these guys, look to these guys, huh? Look to these guys as, as your guide. And they'll help you along to understand these things. Friends, we are told in Scripture to do what? Put our eyes upon Jesus Christ, and we are told to search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. I search the Scriptures today to learn my duty. I need not be told by some man, oh, people can counsel together and give encouragement, that's fine. The Holy Spirit will teach you what your duty is. So the moment common, sacred. The man says, look at this one. Follow what he's doing. Listen to what he's doing. Be careful with that. Our attention is off of God then, right? Off the scripture, and we're looking at this man. I, man, I wonder if that makes sense to you. If it makes sense to me, it does make sense to me, because then the enemy will do what? Doesn't mean that person's not a good person. Doesn't mean they don't love Jesus. There's a lot of good professors. There's a lot of good bishops, elders, teachers. But if the enemy then begins to work many 20-fold, 30-fold on that leader. And if he can get that leader to fall down, then he's taken a multitude of people with him. Our words have influence. Your words have influence. You be careful how you use them. I have to be careful how I use them. I would not for anything try to influence you in the wrong way. But when I believe that something is truth in God's word, oh, how I want to present it. You know, I want the Holy Spirit to take it and present it in your heart and to your ears and to your life. Friend, we're dealing with some big problems here. We're dealing with, with common. We're dealing with, with sacred. And don't, we're going to be naming some specific things. Don't, don't, don't get weary and well-doing here. We're establishing some facts. But some things we'll touch that I'd really rather not. But you know what? The Holy Spirit says, go ahead. Present it. Challenge my people. Test my people. Remind them. Oh, it won't be anything new. It's there, but somehow we've forgotten. Sometimes it's like we open the book and the Bible, we see it, and then we, we put a cover over it. Please don't do that. Take the blinders off. Take the cover off and say, God, you know, re reveal what you would have me to do in here. And you know he will do it. So I say again, we're dealing with a huge, big problem here. And the problem is people are beginning mm, to love the common or air more than they are the truth. They love, listen, they love the shadow over the substance. Friend, you remember chasing the shadow, you're never going to catch it. And when you do, there's nothing there, as it were, if you could. So what do you prefer today? Do you pre prefer the, the shadow? Oh, it's close enough over, it seems like it. Or the real substance? Hmm. Could you, let me challenge God's people today. 
Could you detect if error is being taught in your church? Any kind of error. Could you really detect it as a child of God? Why don't we just name a few things and just see if you maybe can, can detect error. It, it, what, it's, it's happening in your church. And, and, and just notice with me, there's several ways here. Number one, would you be able to detect in your own life, this is personal examination, if you're losing your first love or if you've lost your first love? Love for the truth. Can you even see that about yourself? You know what? Probably safe to say you could probably look at somebody else and say, ooh, they've lost their first love. Well, they're not the same anymore. Friend, look in the mirror. See, we have to be able to detect that. And if somehow we detect something, it's not in a judgmental way, but we want to encourage that person if we feel or sense by the Spirit of God that they've lost that first love. Friend, if you lost that first love, we're, we're in trouble. And that experience that you had with Jesus Christ, love, love, that you've lost that love. And you, you begin to see, notice this, and when we lose that first love, it's not just, well, I've lost it, but when you lose that first love, then worldliness begins to creep and take its place, and it comes into the church. I hear a lot of worldly ideas, and I've heard on the phone and different things, and people have been around a long time, that as, as people begin to lose their grip from the hand of the Savior, they begin to grasp the, grasp the world, and they bring the world in to try to make up for what they have lost. Friend, don't lose your first love. And would you be able to detect this? Would you be able to detect that, that sometimes we see there's much more, we mentioned it, just a little ago, a while ago, the loyalty to men. More and more and more, it's loyalty to man. Look what man has done. But remember, when we give, and it's, it, it's good to be loyal in the right sense. Let's, oh, let's balance it a little bit here. Love and respect our brother and work along with him. But when we have, oh, more loyalty to a man than we have loyalty to God, something's wrong. But can you detect that? See, common and sacred has been so intermingled in that we can't really tell the difference, maybe. Only by, right, the great light right here that God has given us, and by the lesser light. It should be easy for us to detect error. Loyalty to God. And then, could you detect, maybe in the church, that uh, very few, maybe, in the congregation are really able to detect truth from error. How is that? They just can't. Why? Is it because maybe it's not preached from the pulpit. Maybe it's not lived in the life. So it's been absent for so long that we really don't know. And I'm shocked, truly shocked, by the lack of knowledge of professing people of God. They're supposed to know the Word of God. Now again, don't say, oh, somebody will say, oh, what are you talking about? Knowledge is going to save you. You know better than that if you watch this program. Knowledge is a wonderful thing. Thank you, God, for the Holy Spirit and the knowledge that He gives. That's not what I'm talking about here. Has it been so long that maybe you have forgotten the difference? You don't really know truth and error. People get up there and tell you uh, some things, and let me just mention a few. We've got a few minutes left, and let me tell you, uh, you hang on to your seat. You have, anybody have a seat belt? I'd fasten it if I were you. It may, you know what? Some of you will hear this and you just be offended by and by and you don't want to hear it and just say, oh, I, I don't want to hear that anymore because, you know, I don't believe that anymore. Really? Was it a truth one time to you? And now maybe because the world's taking over, it no longer matters or you don't see it this way anymore. Oh, friend. Oh, how God is calling us to be loyal to Him. I just wonder if, you know, Sometime in the church, people think that salvation depends upon belonging rather than a heart conversion. Because I belong. That does not take, that's nice to belong to something, but it's heart conversion that God is looking for. That's what we need. It's not because, well, I belong here, therefore I've got it made. Would you be able to tell that these beautiful truths that God has given his last day church was thrown into the trash heap. Is somebody still with me? Would you be able to know the difference? Somebody changed up something just a little bit. Would you really be able to identify that? Or even if you did, if there's a little quickening of the spirit, you might say, well, there, 
not picking on the professors, but the, the professor said that it was. The pastor said that it was. Friend, go to the Word of God, get your Bible, find out whether it is, it is truth or it's not. So would you know if some of these beautiful truths have been thrown into the trash heap? I pray that you have. You say, well, well what? Friend, I'm very concerned and just, just, just let, if I have a concern, just let me air it. Would you do that? And I've seen it, and I've studied it. I, I have a problem with some of the teachings about the, the nature of, of Christ. Such division on that. It's so complex, but yet it's simple enough that we can all grasp the basic principles of this truth. Why can't we grasp this view of the nature of Christ? Would you know in the church, we'll be able to identify, we're talking about the nature of sin. Do we understand the issues of righteousness by faith? Why are we hearing more about that? Again, the nature of sin, the nature of Christ. Many of these things we call the, the pillars of the truth. The list goes on. But what about unity in the church? God's promised that to the church. What's wrong with it? God help us. Are we having problems in the church realizing that God has promised us victory over sin? He's promised it to us. He's able to produce that. He wants you to live that kind of life. He's coming after a people who have gained that victory through Him. Would you be able to detect if a preacher got up and he was preaching a message and he said, oh, praise God for Calvary. And you're saying, oh, glory, hallelujah, that's right. Praise God for the Calvary. And you know what? Praise God, it, it ended at Calvary. No. Did not end at Calvary. That's another doctor, another teacher, teaching, may I say, of the, of the enemy. But I'm saying, would you detect it or would you say, well, I heard that and it doesn't sound quite right what I've been taught, but they should know. Yeah, they should know. But did, can you detect that error? And they have, what is it? The common man has come up with this and the sacred. Put it together to make us acceptable to other faiths, other denominations, other preachers, teachers, whatever it might be, acceptable, but I want to be acceptable to God, don't you? That's the most important thing right there. You know, and then how about the three angels' message? Can you detect, do you even understand what it is? I know I'm limited on, on knowledge too, but you know, I strive to understand at least the basic principles of this teaching, which this church is built upon. I hold them in high esteem because God has put it in His Word. I cherish those thoughts and those words on there, and I feel convinced by the Holy Spirit power. This is something we're to warn the world with, not give that a watered-down version of it. A watered-down version means you've taken the common teachings of man, and you've intermingled it, what? With the sacred, the Spirit of the living God. Friend, you're not going to come up with truth. The world will not be converted like that, as it were. People of the world, oh, the world's not going to be as a whole. We know that. But God has good people. They need to hear the truth. Not say, I'm going to water it down, sugarcoat it, so more people will accept it. You want half converted to come in? No. We want the truth of God's Word. We want it to hit hard. How come is it we hear so little about the gift of prophecy in the church? Why is it we can't talk about the spirit of prophecy? Oh, some of you can't. We hear very little about it. It's identifying mark of God's last day church. What is wrong with that? Why is it we hear it so watered down in this life? Well, it's, well we, in denial many times, please don't do that. The mark of the beast, the heavenly sanctuary, that things are not being taught the way they used to be. I have a burden. I'm not trying to blame anything or anybody. I'm just saying I hear differently. And many people who should know better because they've been mingling the common with the sacred hear very little about a diet anymore, things we take into our body. We hear very little about the things that we put on our body anymore, put on our body. Oh, we don't want to tell you know why? Because it's not popular. Most people are afraid to talk about ordination, ordination of women, as far as elders and, and pastors and so on and so forth. We're getting ready to do a series on that. You know, it either is a biblical teaching, and if it is, let's be supporting. Everybody get it together as a worldwide work. If it is not, let's put an end to it. Come on, what do you say? It's a blessing or a curse. See, this is what it boils down to. It's not we're going to make somebody happy over here. What does God say? Surely he would not have us confused on these issues. Surely he wants his people here in these last days to know. You know, bottom line... If you love the world and you love the common things, 
eventually you will hate the truth. Oh, I don't want to say that. Eventually you will hate the truth. And not just hate the truth, but you'll turn on those who maybe have been teaching the truth. If you don't love it, you will. Because yes, it's testing. Yes, it's, it's very trying sometime. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a life-changing thing, and it should be. That's what the truth does in your heart and in your life. Manuscript 33, in, 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 written in 1911. Please listen to this quote. Our time's almost gone. Come on, stay with me, please. Listen, this is important. People seem to be growing cold to the gospel. It starts out this way, and how my heart related to that. And how I believe that I would be growing cold to the gospel if the Holy Spirit wouldn't constantly impress me to be reading and studying and praying and witnessing. You understand what I'm talking about. You do. I'd be growing cold too. But I noticed in the world, the world just seems like it's not subject to, to God anymore. They're not really wanting, they're wanting to talk around him and over him and, and through him a little bit, but not really get involved in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's like they're, you know, God, where are they? I can see in the Bible that God's prophets cry out, said, is, is there anybody anymore? Is there somebody that loves the truth? If you love the truth, why don't you show up? If you love the truth, why don't you, won't you write us and tell us about you love the truth? We need to understand that these things are either affecting by the power of the Holy Spirit or they're not affecting you. And that you might, do you love them? I hope so. So this, this article started out here quickly. It seems that people are growing cold to the gospel. Notice this. So again, why is there so much resistance to the, the truth? Notice this. Those who resist the light and truth will become more hardened and unimpressible. More bitter against those who love God and keep His commandments. Friend, do you think you're your path is going to be easy. I know you hear it a lot, but please keep this in mind. There's tests and trials that are, that are awaiting you. You accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The enemy's going to come against you to tear you down. It's impossible if you keep your hand in the hand of God. Friend, will you do that today? There's some of you who are cold right now. You're lifeless right now. You've been in the movement for so long you've lost it. Please, right out right now, why don't you come back to Him? Why don't you? You're sick of this common. You're sick, and, you're, and, you, and you, you, want, you want the sacred. You want that which is pleasing in the sight of God. And all the calls that we get, I'm telling you, my heart goes out because they say we just don't hear it anymore. Why not? Why not let's get back to it? Why not let's get back to the Word of God? Let Him rule and reign in your heart and in your life. This is the time to make that decision. It's very simple. Just, you know, get out on your knees or if you're driving along or whatever, you're watching, listening, whatever it might be, just say, Lord, you know what? I want back what I once had. I've lost it. But I want it back. Please give it back to me. Oh, how he longs to hear that, that plea from you. And you know what? He'll give it back to you. And more in abundance. I want to pray with you right now as we close. And, and remember, you're going to pray for us, right? You're going to be calling in. You're going to email. You're going to be right, encouraging. You say, these are the messages that we need to hear in these last days to be ready. So as I kneel here, maybe where you can, kneel along with me. Let's pray together. Merciful Father in heaven, once again, we so thank you for your precious word. Thank you, Lord, that you remind us to come apart and be separate from the world. Touch not the unclean. You've forbidden us to join together the common and the sacred. And oh, how often in so many different ways, and we'll be going into more of those, how we see it happening today, not just in the world, but in the church. Lord, help us, we pray. Bless those who made that decision for you today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we thank you so very much for joining us. We know sometimes it takes. I hear people say we set our alarm, we get up at 6 o'clock over here, or if it's Dare to Dream, or if it's you know, on 3ABN, or if it's on the radio. Listen, we thoroughly appreciate that. We realize, realize that is a commitment that you made to Jesus Christ. And because you want to hear these things, oh, would you help us to continue to make these, to get these things out, what Jesus is soon to come. We're going to be accountable for the time that we have. We have no time to lose. Lord, we just pray that the Lord will be with you, be with your family, and answer that prayer of faith that you prayed to him today. You've asked him to come back to enrich you, and I'm so thankful that you did today. Until next time, God bless you. We'll see you then.